The material contained in the Divergent Clear podcast is for informational purposes only. The ideas and opinions expressed in the podcast does not represent the views or missions of National Rail Passenger Corporation or Amtrak or the Washington Metro Rail Safety Commission. This is the Divergent Clear podcast. Approach diverging, milepost 20.04. Diverging clear, milepost 20.06. Welcome to Diverging Clear, your transportation podcast, with your hosts, William Moore and Jermaine Walker. Welcome to episode four of the Divergent Clear Podcast. To strike or not to strike? That is the question. I'm your host, William Moore, and I'd like to first thank you for tuning in and also don't forget to click the like or subscribe button for this podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, Google Play, Anchor, and any other platform that you listen to or watch your favorite podcast. So let's get down to business. Uh, a couple things are going to be covering in this uh, in today's episode. First thing, uh, going to catch you up on some news. Been a while since I've been here. Uh, just getting the episode four on season two, but uh, just want to touch up on a couple things before we get to the major story um, that I'll be breaking down here, which is the uh, contract negotiations uh, between the carriers and the uh, major uh, unions of the uh, rail industry. Now, several of the industries or unions have reach tentative agreements, but the biggest uh, sticking point right now is uh, between the uh, BLET, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, and SMART, which uh, represents the conductors and uh, uh, the conductors for the uh, for the railroads. So we'll get to that here in a second, but first I do just want to catch you up on a couple of the news stories, and uh, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So the first story we're going to cover is going to uh, deal with the STB uh, concerned with service troubles that could impact the grain harvest season. Now, the STB is well aware of what the, uh, the implications have been with the, uh, the lack of, of uh, resources the railroads have been providing to be able to provide uh, reliable transportation. So uh, this is just a little tidbit. This is from Progressive uh, Rail. Uh, Progressive Railroad in their Rail News Wire. This was on October, uh, August 22nd, 2022. And this story uh, says, in light of the recent freight rail service problems, the Surface Transportation Board is expressing concerns about the Class 1's ability to meet grain shipping demand during the upcoming harvest season. In an August 18th letter to the Class 1 executives, the board said it was looking, to, looking forward to hearing from them it was looking forward to hearing from them at the August 25th meeting on the, at the National Grain Car Council in Kansas City, Missouri. Created in 1994, the council provides information on current 
and emerging issues related to transportation of grain by rail, as well as marketplace conditions affecting supply and demand for the U.S. grain. The council members include representatives of the Class 1s, large and small grain shippers, short lines, and private rail car industry. The council advises the board on prevailing and up operating conditions in the rail industry, as well as railroads preparedness to meet the demand, the STB letter states. The board is particularly interested in your reports related to your preparedness to meet the demands of the fall harvest as it begins to ramp up in September and extends through the turn of the year, the letter states. In light of current challenges affecting our four largest Class 1 railroads, the board is concerned about the Class 1 railroad's ability to meet grain shipping needs and is highly focused on whether railroads will have sufficient crew, locomotive, and equipment and capacity resources along key corridors supporting domestic and international markets. In addition to hearing from the Class 1, the board is interested in the views of the NGCC shippers, short line and rail car industry members on these issues. The STB members wrote. So basically what uh, has been causing our supply chain issues uh, continue to worry the STB uh, um, to make sure that they'll be able to handle the uh, grain harvest season, uh, the 2022 grain harvest season. Um, you're seeing some trends in the right directions in certain areas, but I definitely can understand why the STB will be concerned. Uh, we'll keep an eye on this. We'll see if the railroads are going to be able to uh, meet these challenges of the uh, set of the uh, of the uh, for the grain harvest season coming up. Uh, next story, I want to uh, just touch on here briefly is Class One's report slight uptick in July employment levels. So according to uh, Progressive Railroading uh, news, uh, news feed here, this is uh, published on August 24, 2022. It says Class 1 employed 116,407 employees in the United States as of mid-July, which represents which represents a 0.13% increase compared with June employment levels and a 0.64 bump from the uh, July 2021 levels according to the Surface Transportation Board data. Three out of the six employment categories logged month-to-month -month increases. They were executives, officials, staff assistants up 0.097% to 7,800-308, uh, sorry about that. 7,838 employees, professional and administrative up 0.47% to 9,905, and transportation and engine crews up 0.336% to 48,252. The three categories that law decreases were maintenance of equipment and stores down 0.33%. Uh, down 0.33% to 17,324 employees, maintenance of way and structures down 0.26% to 28,417, and transportation other than train and engine down 0.09% to 4671. Year over year, the two categories posted increases, executive officials, staff assistance up 7.0%, and transportation T&E train and engine up 1.59%. The following categories posted decreases, which is professional and administrative down 1.8%. Transportation other than train and engine down 1.27%. And maintenance of equipment and stores down 1.1%. Maintenance of way and structures was down 0.034%. So what does that mean? In short, uh, what it means is that um, the railroads are hiring, but not fast enough. <laughs> it's a, I guess would be the Cliff Notes version of that report. Um, and just to give people just kind of a, uh, 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 people are, it was a time where if you got called by the rail industry to come work, it was like you hit the lotto. Uh, they called it, it was kind of proverbially called the railroad lotto. 
everybody wanted a job there, but everybody never got a, everybody don't get an opportunity to work for the railroads. But that's how it used to be. Now, it's not quite that way. Uh, I, it's a couple stories uh, over the last couple weeks when they came up, but uh, Amtrak is looking to hire 4,000 employees. Where uh, Amtrak is now uh, with 4,000 positions open. Um, looking for, you know, for qualified or people, you know, that they can train. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> uh, the, the railroads are, uh, just to say the least, railroads don't quite offer the best uh, lifestyle and, and benefits packages like uh, that was once uh, kind of a, a, the biggest attraction to the railroads. Uh, people loved it because it was able to get good insurance, you can make good money, able to take care of your, your family, but uh, the dynamics of that have shift, shifted. Uh, the t and &E side, it, we, it, the rail industry definitely needs more employees than what we currently have. And I'll just be honest with you, I'm just not sure in, in this current state if, if we're gonna be successful in getting those people uh, that we need to get in um, at any of these organizations. Just We'll talk about some of that in the main story, but that was just, uh, just a little nugget that I wanted to throw in there for the uh, uh, for this this story, because a lot of this stuff, we, <laughs> the first two stories are going to be related to the uh, to the main story, employment, uh, ability to handle traffic. So, you know, that'll be uh, I say all of this stuff will, will all kind of tie into each other at the uh, uh, once we get to the main story. So the next story we got here. seconds here so we so uh, this uh, story out of uh, railroad I'm sorry progressive railroad in uh, August 25th 2022 and it says uh, US railroads law carlo traffic surge in week 33 So U.S. carload volume rose 2.9% to 237,404 units in the week ending August 20th compared with the same week in 2021 according to the Association of American Railroads data. The railroad's intermodal volume fell 2.4% to 264,144 containers and trailers during the week compared with a year ago. That troubles me. I, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I hate when I keep, or I dislike when I see intermodal volume constantly falling when, you know, there's there's other issues that should be, that, that number should be increasing. But I talked about that on a different episode, but I don't like that. Um, that's got to change. Carload and volume intermodal volumes combined, U.S. Railroads law 501,000, 548 carloads and intermodal units of 0.0, I'm sorry, 0.1% increase. Now I'm needing a full percentage point. Seven other carload commodity groups that the AA, the AAR tracks every week posted increases. They included coal up 4,321 carloads to 68,280. Grain up to uh, 2,825 carloads to 20 to 20,974, and farm products excluding grain and food up 2,128 carloads up to 17,031 cars. Commodity commodity groups that posted decreases included miscellaneous down 1,951 carloads to 8,600 carloads even. Metallic ores and metals down 1,248 carloads to 22,270. Petroleum and petroleum products down 627 carloads to 9,681. So those are the numbers. I know it's a lot of rattling off of uh, statistics, sort of, kind of. <laughs> but uh, what it shows is that uh, for the most part, the, the, the traffic volumes are remaining steady. Uh, certain areas, and that's just the fluctuations of the, of the, of the, of the supply chain uh, needs and, and, and uh, you know, for critical uh, raw materials and different things like that. So, 
nothing too concerning except for I always point out the, the drop in intermodal. That just uh, to for the life of me, I just uh, I hate seeing stuff going off the rail and possibly being uh, rubber tired instead of being used by uh, instead of being moved by train. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that. We'll see how the how the traffic trends. I may have to do another episode on that one, but. Um, yeah, just this this report just shows the car love that the uh, that the volume is is holding pretty much steady. Um, nothing to really sneeze at, but uh, that's where we stand at here as of the week uh, week thirty three of the year. Boy, this year that went by fast, and uh, that's where the U.S. railroads stand right now. So we're gonna take a quick break here for the. Uh, Diversion Clear Podcast. Take a quick break before we get to the main story. And, uh, yeah, we'll take a quick break. I don't want to talk your ear off too much because I'm already talking too much. (laughs) But uh, be right back here uh, in a couple seconds, and uh, we'll get into the main story here. Diversion Clear is sponsored by EME Rail Solutions, LLC. We don't own rail cars, locomotives, or tracks. But if you do, we provide cutting-edge solutions to maximize your assets. Visit us at emerail.net to learn more. Divergent Clear is also brought to you by Three Kings Freight Brokerage, LLC. Visit threekingsfreightbrokeragellc.com to learn more about their services. And welcome back to the Divergent Clear Podcast, episode number four. To strike or not to strike? That is the question. Don't forget to uh, click the like and subscribe button for uh, the Divergent Clear Podcast on YouTube. It's also available on Spotify, Apple, Anchor, Google Play, and any other place you may you find your favorite podcast. Don't forget to share this either. You know, trying to get this following up. Uh, this is a, going to be a pretty good story here because I'll be honest with you, I'm a, I'm a strong supporter in labor, um, strong supporter of unions. Uh, although I am in management at Amtrak, I think it's very important that uh, labor and management uh, can get on the same page because it only benefits everyone. But I'm not suggesting that you get on the same page by continuing to do things uh, that has kind of gotten gotten you in this uh, position here where uh, you can't attract attract quality talent. Um, but we'll break that down here. We're about to go ahead and get into this now. So the main story here is the simple fact that the uh, rail unions and the carriers can't get a contract. Now, when I, I'll be honest with you, I was a yard master for seven years at uh, Amtrak. And when I got there, our contract had expired. Um, it took five years <laughs> for a contract to get negotiated. So I was in my, yeah, my fifth year as a yard master. Um, we have been working five years without a contract. Um, and typically what will happen in those situations is that over those five years, whenever they decided on a final contract, they would retroact your pay. Uh, you basically would get back pay for those five years that you was working without a contract. That last time, they didn't quite do that at all, not even close. Um, it was very, uh, how would I put it? Bullshit, I'll I'll tell you, (laughs) because they did not want to pay the back pay. I believe they gave us a lump sum and with some kind of tweaking of what they actually owed us, they ended up up paying less than what they actually should have been paying or they put it for. It was something weird, but it wasn't just a clean, clean cut. Okay, this is your, your hours work. This is your back pay. That didn't, it didn't work out that way. So the only reason I bring that up is because um, it's sort of kind of what's going on right now again. Um, they, the carriers are doing their absolute best to nickel and dime the people that move the trains and get it and to move, that move the trains 
work the trains and deliver the services and, and that's promised and it, that delivers the stock value. So, you know, this is some one of those things where I just, uh, where I just don't quite, um, I'm very disappointed at how things are going to, to, to say the least. And so when I'm talking about these different things, um, I just like to bring up a, a, a couple points here. The first first thing that I just want to bring up is that it seems that there. I ain't gonna say there seems there is a definite, definite overvaluation of the stock value or the the, the emphasis on stock valuation. Um, and that's I believe that is definitely affecting these negotiations between the union and the carriers. The union members have been busting their you-know-whats since before the pandemic. The pandemic hit and those men and women out there continue to show up for work, continue to move trains, continue to make sure that America had the goods that they needed. And then they turn around in the, in the contract negotiations and some of the things that they that the carriers tried to get uh, or put on the table was absolutely terrible. Um, it was a slap in the face to everybody. Now, I was one that also worked uh, throughout the pandemic. I worked the whole pandemic, didn't call off no days. I was showed up for my shift every day, was sometimes working doubles because other people called off or other people were sick. The first day of the pandemic in 2020, uh, 2021, I missed uh, I missed two weeks when I got COVID. It took me almost a year and a half, but I fought it off. But that was the first time I missed. And there was many other members in the transportation side that showed up day in and day out to move the trains, to move the goods, to do the work, to do the, when, when other people were at home, we're driving through, uh, it, it was interesting, downtown Chicago was shut down to the point where we had to show our badges to even get into the facilities, uh, to get into the 14th Street Yard, to get in uh, other people, to get into Union Station. We were still moving trains. We were still doing this, not knowing what this virus or this, this pandemic was gonna be. We showed up every day. And the things that the railroad, the carriers, the, uh, the class ones did was offer some bogus contract uh, that they knew nobody would want. And they still went ahead and proceeded to offer this up in the, as a slap in the face. So that's just my little, uh, my first uh, kind of dialogue about it. But I'm going to get it. It's going to be some more. So give me a couple minutes here. <laughs> So this uh, story here says PEB recommendations fall short of labor's, labor's concerns, union leader says. So what the company, what the, the story came out of this was, and this is also from uh, Progressive Railroad, and as you can see, my favorite source of rail news for my podcast. Check them out, Progressive Railroading. They got a little app. You can get daily news stories for free if you want to stay up to up to date with what's going on in the uh, rail industry. So this is coming out of the story. Although the Presidential Emergency Board Board's PEB recommendations for a contract settlement between the railroads and unions were a vast improvement over the carrier's previous proposals, they do not go far enough to address labor's quality of cons life concerns, Smart TD President Jeremy Ferguson said last week. When the United Rail United Rail Union's leaders last month delivered their presentations to the PEB. They expressed the need for improvements to quality of life issues, including addressing the carrier's attendance policies, as well as the need for paid and scheduled time off, Ferguson said in a prepared statement to the union's membership. Truthfully, union, union, truthfully your union negoti negotiators feel level of disappointment with the PEB's recommendations. Falling short of many of our requests, Ferguson said. And although the PEB recommended what would be the largest compensation raise that rail labor has received in 47 years, it falls well short of our proposed benchmark to provide our members a rate of pay 
of which they are deserving and that will attract new talent, he said. Smart TD leaders, that's smart transportation division leaders, are evaluating the recommendations of what unions, uh, union options may be. The members of the Rail Union Coalition will meet with the rail carriers representatives in their very near future to determine if a poss possible tentative agreement can be reached based on the PEB recommendations, Ferguson added. The PEB presented its recommendations to President Joe Biden last week. Now, in an updated statement, uh, this was posted on August 29, 2022. Uh, story titled, BLET Smart TD Talks Have Yet to Resolve Contract Issues. Uh, they kind of updated that, that previous statement, which said, recent meetings held between the unions, between the nation's major railroads and unions to discuss the Presidential Emergency Board's recommendations for a contract settlement failed to produce a tentative agreement to unions announced August 27th. The meetings held virtually on August 22nd and in person on August 25th through the 26th did not produce any tentative agreement language that operating craft would accept or that could be presented for our members for ratification, said Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen President Dennis Pierce and Smart, PD, Smart TD President Jeremy Ferguson in a joint press release. Although no tentative agreement was reached this week, Smart TD and BLET remain committed to negotiate over issues that's most important to our members, including wages, quality of life, and attendance, as well as voluntary time off issues, Pierce and Ferguson said. The leaders are the labor leaders are also seeking clarification on certain aspects of the PEB recommendations concerning health and welfare, they said. The PEB issued those recommendations earlier this month under the Railway Labor Act. The railroads and unions are now in the cooling off period to reach an agreement based on the PEB recommendations or according to other terms. No work stoppage may occur during the cooling off period, which expires September 16th. We have made it abundantly clear to the kids that we are prepared and willing to exercise every legal option available to us to achieve the compensation and working conditions that we and our families rightfully expect and deserve, Pearson Ferguson said. The BLET and Smart TD are among the dozen unions that are seeking to resolve the contract disputes with the railroads. So, as you can see, uh, some of the things that's been being that is being discussed in this is uh, wages, quality of life, and. Uh, basically, yeah, wages, quality of life, and attendance, and, and, and being able to do the, th the proper things, uh, to voluntary time off. Um, for those of y'all that may not know, um, <laughs> a lot of people don't realize what railroaders go through and what railroaders do. Um, I do kind of want to make that a point of emphasis. I want to just bring up a few talking points here. Um, about this whole contract negotiation and everything going on. Because for me, this is what it comes down to. Overemphasis on values to shareholders instead of the service that truly drives revenue. Forgetting about the customers and shippers that add revenue streams to the overall bottom line. And in reference to employees, one of the ma many stakeholders in the company, taking their work and commitment to this grueling industry for granted. That's what I feel is coming out of this. Uh, another point I wanted to make here was there was a time when service and traffic volumes drove stack, stock valuations. Now, lack of service and charging customers and shippers more to do less over inflate stock prices. What does, what does this have to do with the star contract negotiations between the carriers and the BLET and SMART? Everything. I'll try to paint a picture of what's happening. Could the American Logistics Network crash like the 2018 housing market because of the rail industry? Yes, it could. And I'm going to tell you why it could. The more and more you, you value stock and uh, the, 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 your overemphasis on stock, you start cutting back, you cut, you cut, you cut, you cut, you cut. And that previous stories I talked about where they were, uh, STB was concerned about whether the major class ones can handle uh, the upcoming gr uh, grain harvest season was because uh, uh, they were worried about locomotives, employees, 
and uh, being the, the number of cars available to move this grain. Now, prior to the pa- pandemic, uh, railroads were started to, with the PSR. I, there's another title I like to use I call PSR, but uh, I'll keep that one to myself. But basically, it was this Hunter Harrison driven uh, policy of do more with less. Now, some aspects of PSR, I do, I completely agree with. I like certain things, certain aspects of PSR. But just like anything else, you got your positives and you got your negatives. You got your pros, you got your cons. One of the biggest things that they did was they started to lay off people when the economy would just go, we just softened a little bit. We didn't go into full recession. But they started asking or not replacing backfilling people that retired. That's what they call, they like to call attrition. When the attrition rates as the uh, prior to the pandemic, a lot of railroaders were getting towards retirement age. When those guys retired, they never backfilled those positions. So they basically shrank their rates by sort of, I, well, I ain't gonna say it's all been that, but a lot of it has been, but they shrank the rank, the ranks of T&E employees by either not backfilling or understanding that there was gonna be a need and never putting people there. That's one thing. So one of the other points why I talk about could it cause major major crash, could, and this is what the, the, the T&E and the Smart and the BLET are fighting for, could it cause a crash, and the thing is, as I say, even during that time, they were uh, they were mothball or they were storing locomotives uh, or selling off locomotives. So they started moving less, uh, moving trains with fewer locomotives, and they had no backups or no. If if traffic was to pick up, there was no way for them to bring those locomotives out of storage quickly enough to get them up and ready. Um, to be able to handle this additional traffic. Now there was a couple factors in that. At that time, that was uh, when PTC was being implemented. Now some of these locomotives, I believe, were gonna have to be retrofitted to be able to allow for PTC to be uh, put into them. Maybe that's why a lot of those were mothballed that, or, or put in storage. That's true. But at the same time they were doing this, the value of their stock was climbing. So the dividends were going up, the value of the stock was going up. So as they shrank and reduced costs there, the stack, the stock was continuously climbing because you know operating ratios were getting down into the low 60s. And what the operating ratio is, is how much money does it take for a, a percentage wise, does it take for a railroad to make a dollar? So most of the railroads for every 59 cent they spent or the, the best ones was was it was operating in the mid 60s uh to low to upper 50s even so in those the operating ratio so it says for every dollar we make it takes us 62 cent or 63 cent to make that dollar now that's a vast improvement over where it was in the early 2000s late 90s you know some places was operating as high as um, <laughs> in the upper 70s to 80s for it would take 80 cents to make a dollar. So what they, some of this stuff did in PSR was it did reduce that operating ratio per se. And I say per se for a reason, because it was taking them less money to make a dollar. So that drove, so that extra money that was being shaved off to make a dollar was being returned to the stocker. Stockholders were being re, or stock buybacks or, or, or paid off in dividends. So. That's where the stock valuation, those numbers were being driven from. They were also cutting back on capital, uh, capital investments, uh, their capital programs, which is maintaining locomotives, which is uh, maintaining or improving infrastructure, which is um, just overall major capital spending was also being trimmed down uh, for, you know, early, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, prior to the housing crash, Railroads was investing, was reinvesting uh, what they were making, and it was paying off. It was a constant cycle. 
they, they would make, they would have good uh, year this year, they would reinvest the next year, and it was just a constant climb. And then it started going back the other way where they was making more money. Now they started investing less and less in, in their capital. Now, understanding that if they've been doing capital improvement projects, some of that stuff will be good. So you can cut back on it. However, there's always a caveat to that. Everyday maintenance, yearly maintenance, things that you have to do to keep your state in good, uh, your railroad in the state of good repair, that doesn't go away. That's almost a fixed cost. But even some of that stuff is being trimmed back. And you can see from uh, some of the, the the numerous derailments and uh, almost daily derailments that we're having out there. Uh, a lot of these derailments are caused by uh, tracks, um, bridges or, or what have you, broken rails. You know, some of these things are just happening. That's the nature of railroading. But... I can tell you, I've, you've seen an, a, a, a large number of that over the last couple of years that you didn't see in prior years. Now, there's like I said, I'm making a, I could be making an assumption, but I'm just telling you, there's been a lot more derailments um, over the past few years than there have been probably in the prior 20. It just, uh, it appears to be that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. That's one aspect of what I'm talking about of why it could cause, a, why this the rail industry could cause a logistic networks crash, similar to what happened with the housing market. Because with the overvaluation of that stock, you're constantly focusing on that and not focusing on the people that actually bring the value to the stock, which is your shippers. If they ain't moving stuff by your, by your railroad, you don't have a railroad. Your training engine service. If those guys aren't there to move the trains, the customers aren't going to get what they need. The other thing that I, other thing that I like to talk about too is the the, the, the volume, traffic volume. Now I read in that story about the traffic uptick and this, this, and that, but the railroads, if you listen to a couple of their revenue sharing calls or their, their uh, quarterly calls, all they talked about was how. Their revenues rose, but their volume dropped. That's a, that should be a red flag right there. It should be the more traffic you move, the more money you make. But they've converted it back to now, they want to move less and charge more. Even though they have the ability to move more, they don't want to move more. That's what everything, all of, a lot of this stuff, is. is it shows. They will rather move less and charge you more then move more and be able to maybe offset those costs with the additional volume. They don't want to do that anymore. That used to be the that used to be the main game of the railroad industry. The more you move, the more money you make. PSR, with a lot of its aspects, are good. But what PSR also did was it made that moving more and making more money, it flipped it on its head. It said, let's move less and charge more. So now you're able to idle locomotives, you're able to idle cars, you're able to charge the shippers more. So you're doing more for less. It's, that's basically what it comes down to. So why am I mentioning all this? Because all of this is affecting what we're seeing right now, especially with these contract negotiations between the smart TD and the BLET and the carriers. Now, one of the things they mentioned was the, the lifestyle. Uh, you know, a quality of life. I'm gonna tell y'all, railroading is not for everyone. It's a lot of people that started when I did that ain't there no more. <laughs> uh, I just be honest with you. It just it, they could not. The lifestyle is grueling. It is grueling. I tell used to tell people out there working doubles, <laughs> uh, work, I, I, work doubles in that tower. And I would look at people, I'd say, y'all lucky I love railroading. Y'all lucky I love what I do. Because the amount of time and commitment that I gave, that I have given to this industry in 18 years, most people would have quit probably after year two. Or probably would have quit after they got dragged down the track by a train car and almost rode. That's a different story for a different episode. But the railroad is dangerous. 
just because you don't, it, it, it don't make the news every day. It doesn't make the news every day because railroading, the, the people out here do what they're supposed to do on a regular basis, on limited amount of sleep, on uh, limited, um, uh, uh, all kind of hours of the day. You know, we're out there all the time. And one thing I was talking to actually, it was funny, I, uh, I can't remember, I think it was Memorial Day weekend. I was out doing what I usually do, watching some trains. And um, I ran into my uh, guy I was in uh, brakeman training school with at the uh, EJ&E named Tristan uh, TJ. And <laughs> he was out moving the train and Waddy. So we sat there and I talked to him for a few minutes. I hadn't seen him in years. And he was number one in my class. I was number five. We had a total of nine in our class. I believe he said only three other guys are still left from our class. And with me making four, because I'm just at a different railroad, so a total of, 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 of out of our eight, only about four of us remain. The other classes fare way worse than that. Um, it's not an industry that it's just imagine this work imagine being up for 24 hours getting two hours of sleep and have to go back and work 24 hours now I'm am I over exaggerating yeah because you by law you're not allowed to work over 16 hours on them if you're doing something that's covered by hours of service you can't work over 12 but that's the feeling that you have because oftentimes if you work at 12, uh, they actually bumped it up to where you get 10 hours of rest. When I started, if you worked 12, you had nine hours of rest. And oftentimes what they would do is they would tie you up early at the 11th hour and 59th minute, you would sign off and then you would be back in eight hours. So that's pretty much a 20 hour day. Because guaranteed you was going to get that call about five and a half hours into your rest to come back to work that night or the next shift. So, but why do I mention these things? These guys are asking for quality of life improvements. What they mean by quality of life, do you know how many Saturdays I worked? How many weekends I worked? How many holidays I worked? How many, and this goes for everybody in the industry. It goes for every single person in the industry. We miss weddings, we miss birthday parties, we miss barbecues, we miss uh, our kids' games, we miss uh, a family member's birthday, we miss, we give up a lot for this industry to do what we do. All these guys are asking for is quality of life, quality of being able to schedule. And I and, and I, I talk about this all the time. This is not the 1920s and 30s. We're in the 21st century. We gotta start as an industry, start thinking about the railroads in a 21st century type of manner. Why do I say that? Because we do still, literally still have agreements that go back, date back to the 1920s that's on the books in, lay, in our contract labor relations, in our contracts, written, written rules. That makes no sense at all. Our, my, strong, my strong purpose, which I think will help improve railroad attendance as a railroad scribe, I hope people mark off all this, give people rotate weekends. They can schedule it, they just choose not to. Go in seniority order. But make it where where guys can actually have time to work or to to work uh, or to have a weekend off once or twice a month. I guarantee your numbers are gone because I guarantee you most of your mark offs are coming on the weekends where people have to call off because they want to do something with their family. What is so horrible about that? What is so horrible about? Guys been wanting to go to work and do their job, have a, and also being able to maintain a quality of life. Now, everybody don't have families, but people have other things that they would like to do on top of work. 
This is not except I keep saying this. I emphasize this when I talk to the people, to, to some of my, this is not the 1950s. People after, this, especially after the pandemic, but even leading up to, people wanted to be able to do other things outside of just going to work. There's much more to life than just work. I'll give you another caveat here. Most people probably don't realize that training engine crew, t and &E, uh, locomotive engineers, conductors, assistant conductors, yard masters, no sick days. If you don't come to work or if you don't take a vacation day, which you, it's ready that you're able to take one, you don't get paid. So if you are legitly sick and you call off, or you're legitly exhausted and you call off, you miss a day's pay. Who can afford that? So now you're putting these, now you're putting people even at more risk. That's why the 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 the, 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 the until some of these people the places start putting uh, paid time off for COVID. If you call COVID, people were coming to work because they had to. Because if you called off, you were not getting paid. It's been like that. There's no reason in the 21st century should any employee not have paid sick time off. Everybody talking about, oh, well, y'all make this, this, now. Yeah. But guess what? We don't have sick time. We don't have sick days. The other thing that's so messed up is, is, is even the, the, the way that the railroads, um, you know, I was mentioning how Amtrak has 4,000 employees or 4,000 openings and Amtrak is probably one of the better places when it comes to uh, the way that they onboard and the, the different benefits that they offer but when you get to the class ones and freights it takes you five years to get to 100% that's top of the pay scale it takes you two years to get two weeks of vacation you have no sick days you have no weekends off you don't have a regular job, so you're working a rotating board. Sometimes, or some of the times, you may be able to get in there, but that's rare. But at the end of the day, you are being pounded, and you're being asked to sacrifice, and they're not willing to sacrifice for you. All the sacrifice comes on one side of the equation. That's wrong. That is wrong. It's wrong that people will have to make a choice between being able to go see a kid that one of their kids play a game and not getting paid. Other industries you see, other places you see, people have mental health days. Trust me, I took, uh, when I would get to a point that I was broken, I would take a day, I would say, the hell with that pay for the day, I need a mental break. Other industries have that for their employees. Because guess what? It gives their employees a chance to refresh and then they're able to come back better. When I took those days, when I came back, I was better. But that's not even in negotiations. They didn't even put that on the table. They just want to run these guys into the ground. That's not fair. You see it all across the country. Starbucks and are, 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 are unionized and you see uh, the Amazon locations are are, are, are uh, unionizing, fighting for these different type of protections. It has to happen. And it has to happen for these conductors and engineers and these yard masters and everybody else that's covered by the BLET and the SMART. It has to happen. We have to start thinking more like a 21st century industry than something that was, that, that's that's by far gone. People, are, oh well, when I started, when I started, yeah, when I started, we used to be able to ride on the side of cars. When my when, when my grandfather was working at the railroad, those guys used to have to climb on the top of cars and, and crank the handbrakes to stop the car. Things have evolved. Our contracts and our, our our lifestyles and the different things that we should offer to these employees has also got to evolve. You want to attract people into this industry? This industry could be very, very, very fulfilling for many people, but the benefits are not. We always have this, it's a, a totem pole. Well, this is how it was, an officer, and so you got to go through that too. 
know at some point in time that's got to change as you can see i'm very pro union on this on this topic because guys sacrifice so much for this industry so much for this industry people that lost wives people that lost you know uh husbands people that lost uh partners people that lost then gave so much because they were always out on the railroad it's time for, and, and at this point in time people don't want to sacrifice that anymore and i understand why because at the end of it guess what happens you retire and and then at, at, after you retire you maybe had two three good years of life left and uh, it's been too many people out that that i've been working that i've worked with or i've seen retire they've given their all to the rail industry and they don't get nothing in return in the end that's sad people see it though now everybody's not everybody's not built for this industry so that doesn't mean that this industry should stay the same it's a dangerous job it's a fulfilling job but it comes with many sacrifices it's time that the care the class ones the carriers make a sacrifice make a, and it's not even like it's they'll probably do better i ain't gonna say they probably they will do better Take this stuff off of the table trying to go with one man crews. That's a major sticking point too. They want to make a lot of these trains engineer on. Okay, but how are you what are you gonna do with the conductors? What are you gonna do when you got a 12,000 foot train with an engineer on it and a car goes and the train goes into emergency? What are you gonna do in that case? Oh, is the PTC gonna help? Is the PTC gonna help in that? I don't think so. What are you gonna do have Roman uh Roman uh utility men that's following that's 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 traveling a certain territory? All of this stuff hasn't been put on the table. You want one man crews, but you haven't said you haven't even proposed buying out that position. Y'all just gonna take the position. I don't think that's gonna work. I don't think it's gonna work, and I don't think it should be. I don't, I don't think a lot of this stuff should be happening. These men, women, and I just so I'm not being and and whatever identity people identify as not non-binding gen, gender conformity. I just probably screwed that up. But I'm talking about the people. People in this industry give all, give a lot for it. Railroads need to recognize that. Railroads need to recognize they need to offer. You, you, we're, we're at a talent drought right now. The good people don't want to come work for the railroads. Y'all got to stop being so, uh, stubborn on these, not wanting to pay people on a, when they training. Y'all got to stop, be, uh, uh, don't want to pay engineers to qualify or pay them a reduced rate. Y'all got to stop that stuff. Y'all got to stop these loan uh, progressions to get time off. You got to offer people stuff, good stuff, for them to make, to want to make this sacrifice for this industry. Because it's, it's, the saying is not old. When you work for the end, for the railroad industry, Everybody works, and your family works for the railroad industry. Not just you, not just the person stepping on property. Your wife, your husband, your partner, your kids, everyone becomes a part of that industry or that company. Because oftentimes their lives are based upon what this company decides you have to do and when you have to do it. So the title of this episode was to strike or not to strike? That is the question. The question is, is are the railroads gonna step up and do the right thing? Because if they don't, it's 
It'll be a strike. Do our supply chains in our nation need that? Nope. But I don't think the union should bow and take uh, take a, 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 a terrible deal without those uh, without those improvements to quality of life, voluntary time off. They need that. We need that as an industry to get good people and keep our people fresh. So at the end of the day, I hope they I hope that this uh, PEB, this presidential executive board, comes back to the table with some better recommendations than what they got now. Because we need that change in quality of life. We need that for the rail employees. We need it. Period. No problem. No, no doubt about it. It's needed. So as we're as I'm wrapping up this episode, you know, I just want to say I hope that everything comes to comes out pretty good with the unions. I'm hoping that this contract comes out better than what it what we've seen so far and why this contract negotiation is dragged out so long. I hope that the railroads don't keep pushing for some of this stuff. Give these people sick time off. In these draconian, these these 1950s and 40s and 30s contracts where people can only, uh, it takes you five years to get to 100%. And they step foot in that door and they get qualified. Once they come out of training, put these people at the full pay scale. Like, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Give these employees sick time. Give them paid sick time. Whether it starts with five days, 10 days, give it to them. They deserve it. After what we all just in this industry went through during the pandemic, People sacrifice, some people even sacrifice their lives in the transportation industry to keep the transportation industry moving. And these are the contracts y'all offer these employees. That's the things. You seen that happen with the nurse a lot of nurses in some places too. Oh, you guys are you guys are essential workers. You're essential workers. Hell, the essential workers. Not even a year after the pandemic. Wow, what are they whining and crying about? What are they whining and crying about? We quick, we are very quick to forget the sacrifices that people made. That was a shout out to my nurses out there too. Nurses, doctors, all y'all that did y'all thing. While y'all were out there working, so were we. As y'all were saving lives, we were moving materials to hopefully keep people alive. These employees deserve better. If you want new talent in this industry to take us to the next level, we need better. We need better ways to promote people throughout the ranks. Advancement is tough in the rail industry. Trust me, <laughs> I know firsthand. But give these, give these employees what they deserve. Don't nickel and dime them on this. Because it's not just them, it's their families that you're also looking at too. I'd like to thank y'all for joining me for today's episode of the Divergent Clear Podcast. Episode number four, to strike or not to strike, that is the question. I don't know what the answer is, but I sure in the heck gave you some hints as to what mine would be. Carriers, class ones, y'all got to step up, do the right thing. Where y'all do it, don't quite have the faith in you, but we'll see what happens. Remember, click like and subscribe on YouTube. Don't forget to share this stream, share it to your buddy, share it to your rail fans, share it to everybody. I want everybody to be able to hear what this railroad life is like, what we sacrifice, why these contract negotiations are at not at even close to being fair. 
people sacrifice for this industry. Time for them to do the same thing. Let me be quiet. I'm going to keep going on with this. So don't forget to quick like and subscribe on the uh, on the uh, YouTube. Remember, I'm available on audio on Spotify, Apple, Google Play, Anchor, any other place that you uh, can get your, uh, your podcast. Eventually, I'm going to switch over to be able to do this and upload this on Facebook. I guess I got to start doing that too, but... Um, Thank you for tuning in. Leave your comments. Remember, uh, you can follow me at Divergent Clear Podcast um, on Facebook. Instagram is the, the, the Divergent Clear Podcast. I'm oh, sorry, Divergent underscore Clear underscore Podcast on IG. And on Twitter, follow me at the Divergent Clear One. I think that's my Twitter handle. I might have got that wrong. Quit Diverging Clear Podcast and it'll come up. <laughs> um, other than that, thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, questions and comments, don't forget to shoot me a, uh, if you want to shoot me a message on uh, an email, you can shoot it to uh, divergingclearpodcast at gmail.com. I like your, I like your feedback. Give me some some uh, heads up, or give me some, give me some of your stories. Railroaders, I like to talk to some of your, you know some of you railroaders out there. Give me some of your stories and comments. I would love to do a whole podcast just talking about the different things and challenges that we go through that people don't understand, and how you guys are still even even among all of that. Y'all get out there, y'all do y'all job safely every single day. So leave me some comments, shoot me some emails. Share this with your other railroaders. You do have a you do have an ally here. The union members, you have an ally here. I believe in what you guys do. I've been here. I've I've done this. 18 years I got here. And I know many of y'all got are trying to are, are, are get on those trains every day. So um yeah, so share your share your story, share your comments, man. I love to hear from you. Y'all have a good evening. Thank you for coming out. This episode is also dedicated to my mom, Crystal Real Moore. Rest in peace, mom. You know, I was going to give a shout out to you. I love you. See y'all soon. Talk to you later. Clear is sponsored by EME Rail Solutions LLC. We don't own rail cars, locomotives, or tracks, but if you do, we provide cutting edge solutions to maximize your assets. Visit us at emerail.net to learn more. Divergent Clear is also brought to you by Three Kings Freight Brokerage LLC. Visit Three Kings Freight Brokerage LLC.com to learn more about their services. The Diverging Clear Podcast is also brought to you in part by Precision Logistics, LLC. Precision Logistics, LLC, meeting tomorrow's logistical needs today. Visit www.precisionlogisticsllc.info to learn how.